Welcome back to Lynch Weekly Daily Wednesday, where we can sit back, relax, hello, hello. take a midweek break, talk about some of the interesting, interesting things. Maybe the stranger things going on in the world of Linux, open source, all that fun stuff. I'm Vin Stone. That is Joe Bryant. And joined every week, as always, one Pedro Mateus. Hello. Everyone at home, watching this live, maybe after the fact, listening like most of you are. What's up? What's new? It is most definitely another great week for Linux. Um... I was talking a little bit in the pre-show um, about like aspirational things, not like crazy aspirational things, but things that are within reach, you know, like maybe a, um, you know, not, not private jet, but maybe a fancy video card or, you know, a super high end CPU or something like that. I ran into just that thing. You know, it's that little thing to chase for like, hmm, maybe I'll save up and get one of those because I was looking for some. 500 series modules and just a rack to put them in. Those things are ludicrous for me. They're stupid expensive, man. They're like five, 600 bucks. It's like, wouldn't it be neat if somebody made like the, cause you can get like, you know, anything that you'd normally get in like a full size rack would be 19 inches, but these are small little modules that you can just stack together and you can get, you know, preamps, compressors, deessers, anything that you want and kind of chain them together. It's like, wouldn't it be neat if somebody made one when like light pipes ate at so I could take a digital signal and route it through that? And I, a company does. Of course, company does. One company does. And that's always a problem when one company makes something because <laughs> they get to charge whatever they want for it. It's like 400 bucks. So I'm now on that, uh, probably multi-year path of trying to, it's like, well, no, no, there's an actual legitimate use case of, for this other than you want to play with it, Vin. So that's where I'm at. What about you, Jill? Okay. Aww. <laughs> so I celebrated Star Trek's 54th anniversary yesterday. Yay. It premiered on September 8th, 1966. So yesterday they had a 24-hour uh, mar marathon playing some favorite episodes of Star Trek, and the actors had a fun meet and greet online at StarTrek.com. And it was a lot of fun. It was, it was wonderful to be able to celebrate even though I couldn't go to the big convention this year for obvious reasons. <laughs> so that was nice. How about you, Pedro? I heard you got a uh, new monitor. I did. It is actually, in fact, a monitor, but it's a 32-inch uh, 2560 by 1440 monitor. It's just uh, 60 hertz, nothing fancy, but oh, it is IPS. What are you, a peasant? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I am, because I'm using it as a TV. Well, to be fair, Nori's the one uh, who's probably going to be using it the most as a secondary monitor. But, uh, yeah, no, it, it it's a TV, and uh, so... At, at the exact same time that the TV arrived, TV, um, the uh, Noctua 92mm fan that I had ordered to go in the back of the Steam box also arrived. So, yeah, no, Amazon uh, killing two birds in one stone or uh, killing both my productivity and Nori's. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you can keep busy, man. Uh, let's jump right into it. I made a thing. Typically, like, once a year, I make, like, the state of uh, just what I've stuck together and how we're doing the show. And this year was no exception. I threw this out on the internet. This one for patrons about a week ago. And I'm like, hey, if you're curious about how we stick everything together here at LGC. Look at that video quality, man. Let's see if I can bump that up to an per 60. This go. is going to cover Chris. it, man. Um, <laughs> just give you an idea of what you can put together with Linux, uh, mostly open source software, and um, basically a little, little bit of time on eBay and a shoestring budget. I'm covering Outdoor, how that's put together, how we tie it into OBS, and later on, how we stick that into DaVinci Resolve, and I'm back to OBS and how we make a podcast there at the end out of all of this fun stuff. So if you're curious about that, it's there. There's even a parts list for our Jackbox because I know people have been curious about that if you want to build your own. There it is. It's how we use NetJack with Jack for real-time audio. And, you know, one of the cool things about doing all this stuff over IP with the video and the audio, is like these boxes could be in a building next door. You know, there, there's no like real limitation as long as they're on the same land. And, you know, I walk through Adore, how we do all of our plugins for audio processing, 
give you an idea how mix minus works. So we're able to talk over each other, which is critical to the Saturday show. Yes. Yes. And um, <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's, it's, it's part of the game. And, um, you know, sometimes it's fun just to like not talk over Jordan and just watch him because he tries to I'm like I'm talking over you, man. <laughs> so if you have some questions about that, uh, send them my way. Leave a comment on the uh, YouTube video and I'll get back to you. But yeah, this is all possible with open source. Like it's, Yay, right. nice. it's completely on Linux. <laughs> so that's why I roll my eyes a little bit. I'm like Linux audio is problematic. No, it's not. No, it's not. Not even a little mm-hmm. bit. You can get <laughs> yeah, good Yeah, it's results. the audio and the video editing um, complaints that I usually see on the internet. It's like, no, you want Adobe. You want Premiere. That's what you want. <laughs> and no, <laughs> Premiere is not on Linux. <laughs> it's, uh, well, we've had that talk. We talk about that a lot on Saturdays with, if you ever run into somebody that's saying, I'm waiting until Thing X works on Linux, just write that person off because Thing X will become Thing Y the second X. X uh, gets yes. on Linux. They're like, oh, <laughs> now it's this other program that I've never used in my life. Um, it's, <laughs> hey man, if you want to play around with Linux and you want to make a operating system and all that, just do it. You know, don't try to force anyone into it. And you're never, you're never going to convince somebody that doesn't have that curious spark or that need to get mm-hmm. away from like a black box operating system, be it Windows or Mac. Um, yeah. So that's a little thing I threw out for the community. I'm like, hey, go forth and do some cool stuff. But there's a new little, well, not even new. We've definitely talked about it on this show mm-hmm. a couple of times. Yes. Uh, something that's going to help simplify what I do. And it's going to be so simple, even a Pedro can do it. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> though I did already have my hopes sort of kind of dashed in the show notes, but uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> Pipewire, late summer update 2020. Basically, uh, you can see uh, Wim Tamens. Uh, he's the one who's been doing most of the testing. And uh, he's also been doing like internal demonstrations to the GNOME people and the Fedora people. Uh, because, well, right now, it is working uh, for most of the typical uh, use cases that you would need in a g streamer type of solution be it handling pulse audio handling also even handling jack to a certain degree um it uh it's already doing most of that it's not a hundred percent there yet and they do say that it probably won't be for a while still but the basic uh and you know being able to use it that uh, person wim Tamens, uh is um has been able to basically just use Fedora 32, regular workstation that you can download, uh, and with Pipewire, just having Pipewire handle all of the audio. And uh, now he's uh, also asked other people with specific use cases, uh, like people who need Jack to start testing it as well. And there's a screenshot of Carla, um, the uh, Jack application, running in Pipewire with Pulse Audio syncs, also syncs, Jack syncs, and all the sources, and you can wire everything together without, you know, having to go through Jack for the plugin for Pulse Audio, and vice versa. So, yeah, no, that that that's good. If you have Fedora 32 installed in something that's not your production box, I say uh, there's a command in the article. You can just run it. It'll install everything, and away you go. <laughs> Hey, this is wonderful. And it's so nice to see great progress on Pipewire. And what was really great about the article was that they, they laid out a timeline, which was really nice. Um, you know, they're aim- the developers are aiming for Pipewire to be stable and ready by Fedora 34. And that 32 and 33 Fedora will be for um, Pipewire testing, stabilizing, and new features. So it seems like it's going to roll out a little quicker than expected, according to their timeline. I know it's going to be a while before we see Fedora 34, but but um, it's coming along. It's it definitely awesome. is, man. Um, you know, right now, Pipewire can, can communicate with most things like Adore, 
that's really what I care about. I'm like, yeah, you got that going for you, man. Uh, work is being done to make it human readable. So your audio devices through Pipewire are going to show up in applications like Pavu Control, which I'm sure most of uh, anyone listening is familiar with. And it's going to look just like Pulse Audio. It's so simple. Pedro's like, oh, look, thanks. Pavu Control is a brilliant application if you haven't used it and you have to deal with Pulse. Um, now, Pipewire is going to let you create like syncs for stuff like I need to sync to Ulsa or if I need to sync to Pulse Audio and GStreamer, Jack, anything like that. No word on that, Jack. Please get back to me on that because <laughs> kind of need that. Um, now, eventually... The ultimate goal here, I know some of you are thinking, isn't this like core audio? It is exactly, not exactly, but it's close enough where it makes no difference to core audio under um, Mac on Apple. They got that right, man. Um, in the future, in this beautiful moon future that I plan on living in, applications will be able to target Pipewire directly instead of Pulse Audio or Alsa or Jack and um, like Chrome. Chrome has an experimental feature right now. You can enable direct PyWire support. That's going to make life so much easier because if I can connect to that, as long as uh, PyWire is going to maintain some level of network transparency, then I don't have to do this roundabout jack to Pulse Audio sync to net jack to then jack to jack, then break it back out to Pulse Audio. So yeah, uh, exciting, exciting. It'll probably be, let's see, and Debian, whatever. I, I, my goal is to live long <laughs> enough for it to get to Debian. Stable. Yeah. Oh, it'll probably be in Debian 12. Again, Seven to live long enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, always good news. Always good news. Uh, what is this? This is a Twitter post. So what's this about? Well, uh, this is the sole developer of... Uh, the Ubuntu CDE remix, which never happened uh, because, well, he was just kind of working on it because he had some time to spare, but now he doesn't. So he doesn't have time to work on it. And so he's asking on Twitter, it's like, look, if anyone can uh, and wants to, to help, just fork it, build whatever patches you want. If you send me the, uh, the pull request with a patch, if it works, I'll merge it back. Cool. So I had a look at his GitHub, and it's currently sitting at zero forks. Mm -hmm. Because it's, uh, well, I think I can see why. Mm -hmm. um, part of me really wants, you know, you know <laughs> the CDE um, desktop on a modern Ubuntu. That's, that tickles a side of my brain. But the other side of my brain is going, yeah, remember when you tried uh, Trinity uh, no. a few years ago? <laughs> yeah. You couldn't. You just couldn't. It was like... Going back in time is like, oh, there's so much functionality that's Did just like Neo not show there. up and give you some sunglasses? I mean, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's like KDE 3 at the time. It was great, but I've been spoiled, especially by KDE 4, because uh, KDE 4.12, version 4.12 was amazing. And then, of course, KDE released Plasma or KDE 5, and they screwed it up monumentally again. Um, but yeah, it. There's always going to be a niche for this kind of thing. Just, you know, look at Jill and her love for uh, the next desktop uh, environment type of situation. Yeah, I guess. There's, there's an audience <laughs> for this out there. It's just apparently not... Um, Hipsters. Developers. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. Well, as a lover of the classic common desktop environment, I was actually looking forward to the success of this Ubuntu spin. And uh, yeah, as Pedro was saying, I still am using Window Maker, which was based off of Next and Next Step, so and all the things. So <laughs> I really liked uh, Common Desktop Environment was one of my first uh, was one of my first desktops introduction to Unix back in the day on my Silicon Graphics workstations, and I think for Ven too. <laughs> see, I had to use it to such an extent. You know, CD, I love you. On um, I spent a decade dealing with CD on the rare times I was on a GUI with Solaris. Um, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, also, it's a spin, though. Can't you just install CD like a normal person in any other uh, distribution that you're currently running on? You can, but uh, some things don't work currently. Yeah, there's issues with it. There's so. been several ABI mm -hmm. and API changes since CD was uh, active 
widely supported in modern day distros. So, <laughs> so outside of like <laughs> retro hipsterism show title, um, <laughs> what's stopping you from doing what I did? I'm like, hey, I want a modern version of CDE. And XFC is like, here you go. Here's there you one. go. Because that's XFC. Yeah. That's that's like running an emulator instead of playing the actual physical console. I'm okay with that. A lot of people are not. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> CD it, Puritans. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, oh. apparently, they um all died. <laughs> looking at this. <laughs> oh. Come over to XFC. Everything just works. It's awesome. Um, okay. HP has got a new uh, book out for 2004. It's certified yeah. for 2004. Yeah, this is exciting because now we have a, yet another major brand supporting Linux on the desktop. I know. Is... It's like each and every oh, week. So Here's a new yes. thing. Yay. Giving Linux that desktop love. And uh, HP's latest high-end ZBook series of laptops and their Z desktop workstations are now certified to run Ubuntu 2004 LTS. Yay! So that'll come with the uh, support and the guarantee that everything just works out of the box. And the, lab the laptops actually start at um, just under $2,000. It's not too bad. It's, now, it's not we do bad have to for take a high a pause, end. Pause, though. Where do we rate the poorly shopped um, image? I'm pretty sure they could have easily <laughs> taken an actual picture of it and not, you know, just chopped the screen. I onto the laptop. I think that they, wasn't necessary. I'm going to give this yeah. one. I'm going to give this one a this six is... and a half, possible seven out of ten, simply because yeah, you know the perspective's close. Like from a distance, it looks okay. So I'm not going to enlarge <laughs> it because I ever, my dreams fall apart. But mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And um, for those of you who don't know about the the Z Box or Z Box book series. Um, excuse me, the Z book series, is that they're aimed at AI developers and data scientists. And of course you can use them to render animation as well. And they're, they're very high-end workstations. In fact, um, yep. yeah, they come with the <laughs> Intel 10th gen core series or, or Xeon processor and an NVIDIA Quadro RTX or an AMD Radeon Pro GPU. Which is meant for you know crunching big numbers <laughs> and rendering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the workstation level one, kind of like we've seen Dell doing with the Precision line. Because exactly. if you, well, if you go like four or five layers deep into Dell store, you can find the uh, Ubuntu versions of the Precision laptops. Uh, I know. I know you can go to linux.dell.com and you just, there, there's a link down the side that goes like Linux workstations and laptops, but 99% of the people out there don't. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it should be right there front and center, kind of like um, what Lenovo did with the Fedora ThinkPad. It's like, oh, you just go to the store and it's one of the no, options. No, no, part of Part of getting a <laughs> Linux laptop is the adventure of trying to find it on the website. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I can see HP pulling the same kind of shenanigans uh, that uh, Dell currently Dell does. Did. Because yeah. Dell, <laughs> you know, for all of their efforts with uh, Project Sputnik and everything that they've said that it was great and it was this and it was that. And then you try to spec out like the Dell XPS 13 that you'd like with Ubuntu mm -hmm. and half of the options are missing. Mm -hmm. Why? Just, you just got to try harder, man. <laughs> Apparently. You gotta, did you not try the Konami code on their website? <laughs> no. oh. yeah. I have to plug in the SID or connect the SNES uh, Pro 8-bit do controller. <laughs> so you are a resident KDE show. So I am. Here, here, no here we go. I am the worst KDE show ever, mostly because <laughs> I keep making fun of them. When you take um, a break... <laughs> When you take a break from embracing your leather jacket. <laughs> oh, Monster oh. Cameron. Um, anyway, this week in KDE, annotations in Spectacle. What spectacle, you might be wondering, it's the screenshot tool. <laughs> Basically, uh, the screenshot tool now has a so dedicated advanced. button that you can, yeah, just have a very basic drawing feature 
to annotate screenshots or, yeah, literally any kind of notification, which is nice. It's great. Mm. It's amazing. Uh, but the very next thing is how they're changing, like, the system settings, uh, namely the Bluetooth configuration page. Mm. Uh, it's going to be changing from the current layout like it's been for basically since KDE 4. Uh, to the fancy QML settings page that they've been doing for all of the settings in KDE lately. And I'm still not sure I like it, because they did that a couple of versions ago to the advanced window rules, which is something I use a lot, mostly to tell applications that don't remember the coordinates that their window was last spawned in, and just spawn it wherever it feels like. So I go into the advanced window options and I say, no, you spawn there and you remember that. And it does. It's part of the reason why I'm still using KDE because, you know, despite its many, many flaws and questionable design decisions, it's still the best for what I use. So, mm. yeah. And the Bluetooth uh, thing, if they're going to introduce that, it's just going to make... Well, it's going to make it a scroll fest because in the advanced window rules now, you either use the search function that they put into the actual ru uh, rule chooser or you're scrolling a lot because while all the options used to be there, you could see them on the GUI and now you have to use a text-based interface to find them. It's Linux. Deal with what it. What are you doing? <laughs> Dippity <-tops. laughs> <It's a> GUI. <laughs> Aww. Well, I thought it was great to hear that the uh, console terminal launches faster. I've noticed it's it's been a big bit sluggish. <laughs> it's always the one that takes a little longer than others to launch. And it looks like they're uh, they changed the default main window size to be bigger, which is always a good thing. So, because I always have to go in and enlarge them because of vision issues. <laughs> so. <laughs> It, uh, it's good progress. <laughs> the only thing I look forward to Window Manager, to, as long as I can open up 60 virtual terminals and pretend I'm going to have any organization, which I don't, towards the end of the day, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was one of the things that uh, they introduced with KDE 4, which was the ability to scroll uh, over the, like, the task manager. And it would just scroll through the open windows. And if you put on top of a specific icon that had multiple windows open and you hit scroll, it would just scroll through those. That's like, oh, oh, I really like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good on them. Good on them. Very nice. Now, uh, for the artiste. Uh, yeah. We talked a lot about when Inkscape rolled out the 1.9. Now, new and improved. 1. Yeah. 9. Point, point not. Point one. No, one point zero point one. <laughs> there we go. That sounds better. There we go. Yes. <laughs> um, Inkscape one point zero point one has been released, and it has lots of great bug fixes and a few new features. Oh, okay. As My well. first question is: I see Linux, I see Windows. It was like uh, Mac good stuff. Is that how they roll? Yeah. <laughs> I guess if you're on a Mac, you can homebrew it or build it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you to set up a build not... environment on a Mac. I mean, Windows is uh, not yeah. joke either, but yes, they, yeah, they <laughs> yes, always release, yeah, they always release the Mac one later because mm. of reasons. <laughs> mm. But anyways, uh, this release, uh, one of the big, big uh, new features is is it has a colored managed PDF export to Scribus, which is one of my favorite open source desktop publishing apps for Linux. So that's a really nice feature. So you can import all the curves and and colors and whatnot. And it has a new preferences option to limit screen tearing while editing. You could have it, you know, refresh your your artwork quicker or slower if you don't want that screen tearing. <laughs> so that's a it's that's been an issue with Inkscape. So it's nice that they're addressing that. And the other cool thing is if that you're if you're using one of those people who are taking a chance and using Inkscape with a snap. <laughs> The if you're using one of those people, please stop. People don't like being used. <laughs> using people. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Sorry. So anyways, the snap now uses the system's font cache and this and also uh, this finds all the installed fonts for you. So 
uh, that's always an issue with the the snaps to get the preferences loaded and the fonts and all the things. So they fixed that with Inkscape. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's Inkscape. I, I, <laughs> I, think I opened it twice in my life, and it was to remove a single layer. And I hit the delete key. It's like, why are you not deleting? <laughs> oh, there's another yeah. key combination you got to hit. Never mind. <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, it's, it's a specialized tool. It's one of the things you got to learn. Yeah. And uh, long, I've, I've Googled my way through it a few times. <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> but and, you know, yeah, so... same thing, you, you just got to start thinking with vectors. Yes, exactly. And, you know, that's it. We need that this desktop publishing app and the competitor to Adobe Illustrator very bad on Linux, and we have one. <laughs> Good to see the work being done now. Something we've all ran into, maybe you don't run into it, maybe maybe it's happened to you, yet you're blissfully unaware. Is you've plugged in a USB device, typed in LSUSB, only to get like the, the equivalent of a shrug emoji, some numbers, man. Like, hmm. Or would be this? It's not necessarily a problem these days, but you could still run into it. This is on opensource.com. Uh, I wanted to give this a mention. You can find all of this stuff in our show notes after the fact. Recognize more devices on Linux with this USB ID repository. E man, I just think this could also be handy for tracking down unlisted devices. It's a public repository. All known IDs used in the USB devices. That have been submitted. This is community done. Uh, they maintain nightly snapshots. This is easy to set up. And I set it up on Debian. I didn't see anything because I didn't have anything unlisted on this box. But yeah, you can do the, you know, just update USB IDs after you've uh, installed this, I guess you could say. And there it is. You know, more like, I don't know what this is. And you start tracking, tracking it down. You get a nice little name next to it, which, neat. I liked it. Yeah. I thought it was fun. And yeah. I also like the, uh, like, hey, you can share this, uh, your results. You know, if you got some stuff that's not in the database, you can get it updated. Yeah, it's I'm pretty really sure cool. the one thing I remember uh, that when I hit LSUSB it would never show its name, so I could always find it because it was really easy. <laughs> uh, it was an old digital camera that had. Uh, the sensor was terrible. Uh, the pictures weren't very good quality, but it could store 40 of them and it was teeny tiny. Uh, so I ended up using it a lot just because of that. And whenever I plugged it into like my laptop at the time running Linux, it's like, I, I don't know where it is. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm looking really forward to using this. And uh, actually, at one time, <laughs> I know this is a little crazy, but I plugged in 30 USB mice into uh, one of my computers. What are you talking to, about? And... <laughs> a hoarder having 30 mice? No. Oh, I have more than that. <laughs> Probably over a hundred. <laughs> Van but, gave you a way out and you kept on going. going. yes. <laughs> like, oh. No, 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 stop. It's far worse. And it's even more sad than that. <laughs> yeah, the nieces. <laughs> well, the niece. of, uh, yes, of my USB mice. And, you know, I noticed that a lot of them didn't have uh, the vendor names next to the numbers. And so this is a way that I can contribute to the project by including those <laughs> vendor names as well as uh, them being able to bring their database to me. <laughs> so it's kind of good. But, you know, I've definitely given, like, when, when it comes to, you know, a mouse. I look for like <laughs> it, two click buttons. We're good. I, I give um, uh, Pedro I quite 11. a bit of static simply because, <laughs> because Pedro wants to bring drivers into that relationship. Yeah, I, guess he, <laughs> I need to address does. these 11 <laughs> buttons somehow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I address all of these buttons because there's a kernel level driver for it. Yeah, I'd like it to remember <laughs> if I decide to plug this into, say, a laptop. I'd like it to remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see you just avoid buying that. <laughs> I'm not saying the fix for this doesn't involve time travel. Okay, let's just get that on the board. <laughs> it might. It might. <laughs> 
That's kind of brilliant. Uh, something I ran in to and ran across was like, oh, that's fascinating, is we use OBS. I use OBS all the time. Uh, a captions plugin that is using Google Cloud speech recognition. Well, at least it's using the API. And that means it's going to be pretty quick. You know, you usually less than half a second. And this is something that you can build into OBS, you know, with the, just the dbuild, you know, do the captions equals on, drop the plugin in, and away you go. This should work with YouTube, and it should work with Twitch. I didn't try it today because I didn't feel like playing with that much fire, but it's something I'm looking forward to being able to add to Wednesday and Saturday streams. So you'll have a little CC down there for those of us who don't want to hear, especially my grating voice. And, <laughs> or, right, your voice is grating. Oh, no. <laughs> you you don't have to voice. listen to it. The voice in my head sounds like this too. It's horrible. Um, it hasn't been extensively <laughs> tested on Mac. I'm going to shoot out here, but theoretically everything should work that I think that's awesome. And just having that ability, especially with your streams, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, if it is using the, uh, Google, uh, Google, 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 speech recogn Google, <laughs> yes, Google. <laughs> uh, the, uh, Google cloud speech recognition API. That means that a couple this, of things. Wait, hang on, hang on. Is this Google, <laughs> we gotta call this back. Is Google the, uh, like sponsored search engine in Fedorf? Yes. <laughs> now we have a default search engine name Google. too man you're right. building my list for me um the <laughs> but yeah no that that means uh if it is google based <laughs> that it will um first it will screw up in not a whole lot uh, it won't screw up all that much but when it does it will be hilarious and um the like half a second delay that's usually what you get if you're watching a live yeah. stream on youtube and you turn on ccs that's about what you get it's like oh that's really good the we it's going to be to hilarious but it's really it. good yeah like <laughs> over the years we've been able to follow it with our um vods on youtube i mean uh, it, it, it's gotten like from like uh, the game controller mayonnaise the, the dolphin like okay <laughs> to I would say it's probably going to like 98% accuracy now. All right. Okay. No. It's nowhere near. I would always go back, uh, you know, three or four years ago. It was worth just rewatching the show on the CC on because there was some was, good comedy in there. It was amazing. It was. Yeah. It was coming up with stuff that I couldn't piece together. So, yeah. I, um, I'll let you know. I'll probably uh, give it a test. I might give it a test run Friday. So ah, when I go live on Twitch, good. we'll see what happens. Because <laughs> if that implodes, hey, oh, oh no, you don't get to watch me play a video game. Cool. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, we're going to jump into a slice pie. Before we do that, uh, we always want to thank each and every one of you who do make this show possible. We don't have like sponsored ads and stuff like that. We do it all with your support. You are beautiful party patrons at patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. You get us a budget to do the things we do. Also, I get to do a little bit of side project stuff and like do my best to help people uh, come over to Linux. I'm going to throw them some bones. I'm like, you want to do some audio stuff? Hey, we can do that. You want to do some video stuff? I'll try to help you out with that. And um, yeah, it's been kind of awesome. It's kind of fun. Mm, thanks for letting us do that. Uh, we do have a bunch of stuff. If you want to be really fiscally responsible, <laughs> I got a studio list um, on Amazon. You get your name up there. We say some things. Jill and Pedro have unique amazon wish list if you would like to uh peruse that jordan's got the best one though don't don't open Jor <laughs> however disclaimer don't open jordan's at work um uh you could open it at work just not in front of your parents he, or uh. anyone <laughs> <laughs> play it safe and don't do that uh, and everyone uh, if you join us on patreon man come hang out with us in discord there's our super super hyper secret uh room that we're in uh the other six days a week it's not it's a really chill chill group of people to where you get to see matthew wake up and be angry at televisions first thing in the morning <laughs> it's magical it's a wonderful place all your dreams come true and of course we have irc and everything all that fun stuff is live i Throw some extras out there um, if you can uh, support us. You know, we got an extra podcast 
preview super shows and that's a production meeting. You get that, you get a video version. You'll get this show like an hour and a half early if you uh, check out the announcements tab, simply because I have to sit back and wait on YouTube to process everything for the uh, uncut version. So I just go ahead and drop that in. Yeah, I think that's about it. That's our shilling segment. Yay. Yay. Ta-da. <laughs> nice. Now we can get in <laughs> and celebrate a little bit of pie. Even though Google, mm. every time I type to a, I go to search for these pictures, Google's like, slice a pizza? No, Google. Oh, Nay. it's pie. <laughs> not real it pie. It is not, you know, uh, March 14th <laughs> anymore. But, uh, well, there was a sort of kind of pie that uh, <laughs> uh, I you saw. Know, it Pedro, showed up on... I, I thought we had made a pact not to bring theoretical risk five pie into this uh, yeah <laughs> well uh this one is very much theoretical at this point uh there is a plan to create a sort of kind of picorio um which is about raspberry pi size but instead of running arm it's running risk v okay that <laughs> Right. Sounds right. Um, they, mm -hmm. uh, the specs look all right. It's a quad core, 64 bit, uh, 500 megahertz on each of the cores, but this is risk. So you need to remember that each of those core has four threads instead of two. Kind of a thing. Um, it has uh, one 32 bit uh, risk V always on core. Again, risk things, just deal with it. <laughs> uh, it's, um, yeah, no, the. 16 uh what is it uh 16 bit lpddr4 memory uh there's no like amount of memory being uh, discussed just yet i'm sure that will vary uh based I'm, on the different I'm ones reasonably sure it's gonna have two possibly three memory <laughs> yes possibly even uh like 16 megabytes 16 <laughs> but... memory. yeah that's pretty uh, good but yeah yeah, it will be interesting to see. The other thing that I'm worried about is how much is this going to cost? Because if you've seen, and I'm going to keep saying Risk V there, Foxy, um, if you've seen the prices of uh, oh, did Risk Michael V, Michael will stuff. actually even the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly. They're aiming solely for Chrome. That's not well actually you on that, are they? Is he? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, Chrome the article is... didn't say that, but I, I've read other articles that have talked about that, yes. But to Pedro's <laughs> point, to Pedro's point, yes, it's a, a real worry that you can absolutely have if they're like, how many are you going to make? Mm, four? How much are those going to be? Mm. <laughs> about $4,000 well, each? <laughs> yeah. Well, it says that this RISC-V small board computer is supposed to compete with the price point of the Raspberry Pi. I'll believe so, that when I see it. Yep. So that that's a really big deal, and, and it's what we need to bring Risk Five adoption to the mainstream market. So if this is actually true, this is a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yes. I look forward to that being, you know, every other week. There's like, hey, there's this new thing, and I think, well, I want Risk Five to roll out and do some awesome stuff, and I, I it's got to live up to that promise. So. Stuff like this is helping pave that path. Yes. Which is good. <laughs> which is good. But this is not theoretical. Not in the slightest. <laughs> well, to celebrate Star Trek's 54th anniversary yesterday, we have a fun Raspberry Pi project. This is uh, someone has built the classic Star Trek captain's chair with a Raspberry Pi and Google Assistant. And this is uh, Rex's david garcia's journey into that process and uh he he wanted uh, he what he started this project because he wanted to uh find out what would be the best way to integrate uh google into uh google uh that's what i look forward to these days How's google, google <laughs> yeah google <laughs> assistant in into furniture so so this is a really great way uh, to do that. He actually built the chair and uh, he said it was a little tricky because a lot of the online uh, 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 blueprints for this don't have the, the base. And uh, that's true. I've seen, seen a lot of these chairs. So he had to make a very, very strong base, but he just used um, easy to get elements like plywood. And then he, he built the buttons on the side of the arm 
and and link them to a Raspberry Pi, and each each button you know uh, says a different sound, <laughs> like Red Alert, of course. <laughs> love and, and, you want to smash yeah. those buttons and be like, "Danger, little Robinson!" Just so you yes, can aggravate the people who come over to your house. I just have a you know, like use yeah. the force, Luke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's you know red alert and engage and uh con of course <laughs> i definitely have one that you do put like ds9 was the superior series <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> but anyways i i think this was just really fun to to see what you can do with your you know google uh assistant um, and using a Raspberry Pi and have a lot of fun with it. It's the next evolution to the captain's chair <laughs> that one we chair. all know and love. <laughs> yes, yeah. one chair. <laughs> the only thing I've ever thought about that chair, chair is, don't, doesn't it look wicked uncomfortable? Oh, it is. I've actually <laughs> sat. There There are two original chairs and one of them. Well, I would imagine any chair you know, at your size would be wicked uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> But no, I actually sat in one at the Star Trek conventions, which, you know, I worked at. We had one of the originals on stage for the actors to come out and sit in when mm -hmm. they started their talks. And that one's now at the Smithsonian. And I got to sit in it and I put all my triples around me and got a lot of nice shots in it be, um, backstage. So <laughs> that was really cool. And it was not very comfortable. I wouldn't imagine and, so, with your and, little legs dangling. Yeah, yeah, that was a problem. I couldn't touch the the base. And then, yeah, William Shatner has talked about how uncomfortable that chair is. <laughs> so. Seems. Like a chair. Oh, is that why all the captains in Star Trek are always standing around? Okay. Standing around it. Yeah. Well, have you? Yeah, ever, have he you, is hot you, and sweaty. Did you ever see Riker trying to like sit in a chair? He has like. Oh yeah. Leg over it. <laughs> Flip oh it yeah. Around. It's like, yeah. It's strange, yeah. man. I think it's he the does beard. the long leg. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So, so thank you, Artharin, for bringing us this to our attention. I love this project. Actually, I want thank one. you, Artharin, for contributing at least three of the stories yeah. in today's podcast. Exactly. <laughs> one of our, our, our most it's loved executive producers. It. It's kind of brilliant. <laughs> we, we even have a thing in uh, Discord if you want to just drop that in there. We got show notes. Boom. Put it in there. And there's a chance yeah. <laughs> it could, unfortunately, end up on the show. I'm just kidding. Thank you. Uh, Maybe you would like to give us the old um, slow way of contacting us. Be like, mm -hmm. hey, man, I'm a hipster. I need contact forms. This Discord thing's too fancy and new school for me. <laughs> well, you could always uh, pull a Captain Sullivan down in the Mississippi and, um, you know, go low, slow, and easy. Or you can get to the next game cast. I don't know what that was all about. Don't. Don't, I was don't read too much it. into that. I, I certainly didn't. I, I, I <laughs> that. But okay, what's, uh, yeah, what's Ven gonna type this time? <laughs> <laughs> LinuxGameCast.com. You hit the contact button. Make sure you pick LWDW in the uh, teeny tiny little show selection box, and uh, that will make that will ensure that uh, your feedback shows up right here instead of you know on the hate mail segment on Saturday, yeah. where uh, you know the replies or the <laughs> response might be a bit different. Yeah, it could be a little bit. Uh, <laughs> check this out. We got one. It's quick. It's sweet. It's about, I made a video about um, just showing off noise repellent versus one RTX voice launched. I'm like, hey, this little thing that I use all the time here, that's similar. I mean, it's a different tack uh, than RTX voice. And I was like, here's a little video. And this is how you can set it up. And here's a demo. Well, how do we, Alcaris? Alcaris? Yeah. All right, we'll go with that name. So David, setting up Jack can be pretty confusing for new users. <laughs> Who want to get this set up? Because you, you all have just installed Jack, and then the user complains they can't get audio anymore because it's all gone. Ah, oh, man. And they have to go through the process of setting up the device, device so you can get audio as normal. Anybody want to take a crack at decrypting that? Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, uh, Jack is not, uh, you know, me friendly uh, or uh, user friendly in general. No, 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 no. Yeah. Don't, don't confuse them friendly with laziness. I've seen some of the hoops you jump through to get a video game working, son. Yeah, that's because I like playing video games. <laughs> 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 
You're not walking out of that corner, man. <laughs> Jack is... Pipeware is going to help. It. One of the things Pedro wrote in the notes was like, hey, I don't have to set up Jack. And I can just like, it doesn't work like that. Jack is... Dang it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Low latency is designed for professional audio. <laughs> and there is a lot of work that goes into it. It's nothing insurmountable. You're going to have to read some documentations. You're going to have to play around. If you have a USB interface, you got to hold your level of like hard mode on top of you. Um, there's a reason everything in here is a firewire. Um, unfortunately, we don't have Thunderbolt support uh, for any of the new interfaces. But unlike um, USB, USB, Apple, thank you, Apple, they forced everything to be class compliant, mainly because the iDevices, iOS devices and stuff like that. The reason all of your um, USB sound cards and your interfaces work when you plug them into Linux is because Apple did that. It forced them to because you can't have drivers for like your iPad. So it has to be perfectly mm -hmm. spec. With Thunderbolt and like and previously with Firewire, there was a standard, but all the manufacturers like, ah, we're going to put our little special twist on it. That's you we're walking back into that brave new world with Thunderbolt, unfortunately. So setting up Jack is not going to be easy. You shouldn't break anything. Jack and Pulse Audio exist perfectly in modern devices. You can even bridge them together. You can have them running at the same time. It's not going to hurt anything. If you've knackered your Pulse Audio setup by installing Jack, you probably shouldn't be playing with anything because that is an exceptional amount of like, you had to go out of your way to do that. That's, there's no <laughs> manual that says get rid of Pulse Audio. And again, don't use Jack unless you have a need for it. It doesn't sound better. You're not going to notice uh, the latency difference. You're just not. I mean, I play my games with Pulse Audio, you know? Mm-hmm. It gives you more control in much the same way that uh, Linux as an operating system gives you more control over everything that happens in your computer. <laughs> it's just a matter of wanting to learn it, which you don't. Yeah, if you don't have a need. <laughs> See, Pedro's like fights with like, oh, what are the things that Pulse Audio? I've heard Pedro complain about like, doesn't remember the things. That's the mm. laughable easy to fix with Jack. It was like, oh, that's adorable. Um, I walked Jordan through setting up Jack. It took like 15 minutes. He's done. Boom. Good to go. So it is doable. I, I will probably do something like this is your basics of setting up with Jack. The biggest problem, and I'm not poo-pooing on USB audio interfaces because I know some, I know a lot of people, everyone has one but one. Uh, USB is just a nightmare for multi-channel audio. It's a horrible protocol. It's packet-based, and you're going to get X runs. So you that's why you see people who will, like, I did a lot of work. I went through the real-time config scan. I got everything set. Got permissions. I got swappiness correct. Um, I've locked out the memory. And I've gotten it down to only a few X runs every hour. That's why. So I... Hmm. That's why, for me, step one is go buy a PCIe <laughs> Express Firewire card. Because... <laughs> I got to be able to do five hours straight multi-channel without AX run. And I do. Mm -hmm. That's got a brilliant. So yeah, I think that's it. Beautiful people. We have a, we have an overstate or welcome, but you will get tired of us in a minute. If we don't <laughs> go ahead and bail. So let's bring up some <laughs> happy fun music and roll them yeah. credits for the people who make the show possible. Yeah, <sighs> thanks again to our Theron for all the stories. And I agree our Theron. Jack isn't that hard to set up, at least not in modern days. I remember trying to do it back in the late 90s. Oh, <laughs> and, so the and... problem is people confuse getting it set up with the configuring it correctly. Yeah. I did get it to work. I did get it again, to work. Again, <laughs> there's a difference between getting it to work. And... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> configuring it right. <laughs> I speak from that. Oh, it, <laughs> that's why I look forward to Pipewire. Yes. <laughs> yeah, even not having to deal directly with the repercussions of Pulse Audio and G Streamer not liking each other very much, that would be nice. What do you use G Streamer yeah. for? Uh, thankfully, not much nowadays. Uh, yeah, I never <laughs> use it. <laughs> That's my real. Oh. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>